This is our December spark session with the, a holiday theme, of course. Uh, I've drawn a little Christmas tree back there for everybody to gaze at longingfully, because I know many of you are heading into your Christmas holidays next week. Uh, today, we, it's an Ask the Expert session, and we have Corey Burris from eResources and Ginger Martinton from Spark Freedom on today. But before we jump into that, I just wanted to remind you that in January, we'll be welcoming Sue Zoldak on the 19th at 12 Eastern to talk about different advertising strategies. We had her on an Ask the Expert session, and people started asking lots of questions about you know, different ad strategies. So we thought it would be fun to bring her back for a, a solo session talking about ways that she chooses where to advertise, how to organize advertising, and how to advertising, and how to measure her results. Okay, so today's theme's a little different. We're talking about how art and, the, and liberty overlap. And I'm really excited to have Ginger Martinson, who is an artist, uh, and you know, like she likes to physically manipulate things and build them. I'm amazed at what she can put together. And we have Corey Burris from eResources, who is able to mesh art and digital really well. Both of them understand how to integrate efforts like this into a bigger picture, which is something we love to see in, in people working on liberty topics and doing art and talking about marketing campaigns. I'll be on today uh, handling a few branding questions, uh, but I might try to relate branding to art a little bit as we move forward. But you don't really want to hear about me too, too much more. So um, if you have questions, there's a question icon up at the top of your screen. Just drop a question in there anytime during the show. Towards the end, we will handle questions from the audience. And with that, I'll launch the first question. It's for you, Corey. All right. Great. So what do you think has worked well in the digital creative space? Um, for Liberty organizations, and more importantly, what has not worked well? Um, well, I think there is, technology has gotten cheaper. So it's actually become like, there's been a lot more creativity in the digital space because of that. Um, it has opened up the, the doors for organizations, big and small, to try different things. That, that And that's not been there really in the past, because in the past it was very, cumbersome, very expensive to take on and be experimental with things. Um, that said, what you tend to find is that groups that um, can stay really focused on one specific thing and be very clear about parameters and put really clear parameters around a, a project um, tend to be much more successful at being creative within that project. It's when they go, I want to tackle the world, right? I'm going to take on, I want to take on everybody, I'm going to tell them how freedom is great. They tend to lose focus and they tend, their experimentation in that world tends to fall flat in a lot of ways. So um, what I found is that groups that can say, all right, we're going to go after teachers in a specific school district and we can clearly identify their needs and wants and desires. And then they, they can come up with things that are really tightly focused on, on what that teacher needs or what, that, what, what attracts that teacher. And then they, they tend to be a lot more creative in that process along the way. Um, yeah, so I'll stop there and see if anyone else has anything else to say. But. Well, I'm gonna move on to Ginger, but I'm warning you in advance. I'm gonna ask you to give us an example of what has gone well without using Illinois Policy Institute or FGA as your example. So just think about that. I'm looking for like somebody who's had a smaller budget, who's done really well at, at what you were talking about. So Ginger, same question. What have you seen go well in how people in the Liberty Movement are using art and what has not gone so well? I know you're relatively new to our network, so it's, it's always fun to get that fresh perspective. Yeah. Um... So I've seen some really interesting content. I think that's, we're making some cool things. Like, uh, for instance, the Institute for Humane Studies, they have a Learn Liberty video session. They make a lot of different videos with using really cool graphics to tackle issues like, why is the minimum wage not a great thing? Or why is the EPA maybe not so great for the environment? And they, they do it in a way that's interesting and engaging and uses art. Um, the Independent Institute. They did a movie called Love Gov, which I absolutely loved. I think I've talked to you about it quite a bit. It's a, 
it's uh, kind of this parody on a romantic comedy about a woman who, whose boyfriend, Gov, short for government, uh, takes her on a journey through, through college. They go uh, explore student loans and regulations when she wants to open a business. It's, it's just really fun. Um, there's a lot of really cool memes out on the, in the internet, which I think is an art form, tackling liberty issues. That said, we have this cool content, but I do think it lives in the, the libertarian echo chamber. You know, how did I find LoveGov? I think I was Googling liberty art. Who, who's doing that? You know, so I think we have this content, but how do we bring it into the mainstream? How do we bring it to new audiences? I think that's maybe where we could really improve. Thanks, Ginger. And Corey, now that you've had a minute to think about it, give us, can you give us a specific example of a, a smaller organization that's done a great job? Yeah, I think, um, a, I think a big one was, um, and this is for the, this organization was a, a big step for them, uh, Platt Institute in Nebraska. And I only say this because I worked on the project, so I know a lot about what was happening. <laughs> so, but yeah. uh, th we, we helped them do a, uh, a short video um, that outlined a problem that they were having, and then they wanted to pivot on that and and go after. The first one was about um, uh, essentially lowering taxes, and the next one they wanted to use that same audience and try to draw them in on how to grow, uh, remove regulation, and grow jobs. And so they started this new one called Strong Jobs Nebraska, and they did like a really interesting. They took a chance did a informational video that's kind of this animated video that explains the problem, outlines some of the problems that are going on there. And they've been very successful because they said, all right, we're going to go after, first of all, a same group, the same type of people that were interested in it before. Uh, we know that there are these specific people that are at this rally that we can take advantage of. And we're going to go, we're going to try to get their email addresses. We're going to try to send them new information. And they were able to kind of build an audience around a really very specific topic of and, and around people that are already dealing with that issue. And so that was one of those examples where they, they had, they had, because they had clear parameters, they were able to kind of move around within that and try different things and, and get things done that way. So. Thanks for that example. I'm going to answer the same question, which is what have I seen going well in the free market movement for branding and, and what not so well. Um, this is something a, a lot of people have been asking me about branding in the last four months. And so I kind of made up this question for myself as I've been evaluating, you know, like how to best help organizations build stronger brands. And I think the thing that I came into the movement in 2003, I officially got my first job in 2004. And from then until now, what has gone really well is most organizations have embraced a commitment to being visually attractive. And so when I first came in, there was a lot of um, different color size font things going on, especially digitally. Logos were sort of like this hand drawn thing or they were, they didn't even, you know, like many organizations had paid somebody to design them a logo not gotten the source file, had this low quality thing that they were printing that was all pixelated. So there's been like 2003 to 2016, um, people look professional and that's great. I think the one thing that is not going as well as it should is just a, an understanding of what branding is and, and where you should represent your brand in that branding is the promise you give to the people you're trying to help. And that means that every time you touch them it, you should be representing your brand whether it's on a policy issue whether it's on your website whether it's in person like the clothes you choose as as a representative of your organization are part of your brand and how does that bridge into art so a game that we've started playing in some work sessions is to um, we just worked with some organizations on brand development and we'd say okay we're going to ask you if your brand was a movie what would it be and why and then we just go around the room if your brand was a piece of art that already exists, what would it be? So when you start having these quiz show games about your brand, I think it's really, it helps you internalize what you're trying to say uh, with your core message. So anyway, Corey, I have another question for you. 
All right. What have you been working on lately? I haven't talked to you much. Like we used to work together a little bit more closely. And in the last year, you've been Mr. Busy on projects that I'm not working on. So tell us about what you've been working on and how that's been going. What, what's new? Yeah. Um, so uh, we've been working on different projects, big and small. Like I, I mentioned the Platt Institute uh, project we worked on with them. We're working on a, uh, a solution for uh, donation and grant pieces so that um, it, it's actually for uh, grantors to have board meetings and be able to do them online and be able to have access for multiple people all over the country to be able to attend a board meeting have the same experience across the board for all of them. So that's kind of a cool little project we're working on. Um, we found that, see, what we find is a lot of organizations have um, very unique problems that are unique to the free market movement. Uh, either they've made them themselves, their problems, or they have, um, or they have, uh, they just have unique things because of their 501c3 status or whatever it is. And so we, uh, knowing that world can help kind of adapt technology that maybe isn't really built for them to work more, uh, kind of focus it in on them, so to speak. Uh, another really cool project we're working on an app, uh, for an organization. And part of that app project is, uh, getting it to work across multiple platforms at the same time. So we can roll out an update on, on an iOS device and have it roll out a, a couple of days later on Android and a couple of days later on website and a couple of days later on, you know, a, a Windows that, phone. That all across the thing that people, some people use. Exactly. <laughs> like 10 people, but whatever. So, um, I know somebody we, with a Blackberry. Oh yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, well, I mean, we, we help, uh, we've helped build that project. What's cool about that project is that it, we, there is, it's more than just an app. It is about helping connect people. And I think that that is where I get really excited about some of the projects we work on is if we can help an organization or, or a company connect and use digital tools to expand their marketing efforts, right? I'm not a marketer per se, um, but I understand what marketers need to be successful and information is usually what they need to be successful. And so how do we give them the tools to expand what they are doing and and be able to be more effective at, at marketing and be you know everybody has a limited budget so how can we help your budget go a little bit further can we give you tools that make it easier for you so that sounds pretty exciting i'm looking forward to seeing where that project goes i think i know which one you're talking are you like hedging because you don't want to say what it is on the video conference yes i will not okay. say what it is i but, will uh, not bring i think i know but i yeah. won't yeah yeah gotcha client yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Well, that, that's funny because it sounds like the, the good thing about that project is that what's liberty is built into it without being overtly about liberty. It's just giving people information that allows them to naturally end there rather than trying to like right. fight with them about how awesome liberty is, right? Right. Yeah. And I will say, you know, like some of the efforts that Spark Freedom has taken in the last few years to get story out there, storytelling out there has really made my life a lot easier because people now understand the importance of story. And so we're starting to see experimentation in terms of putting story into things that we typically didn't. It used to be like, I have a policy piece that's out here. So I want to, I want to tell people why, you know, this issue is important to them. So I will, now I understand that story is important. Now they're actually trying to experiment of, oh, we want to put out this, this, other thing over here that is not a policy issue. And we realize that to do that, we need to tell the story of why that's important. And that's been kind of neat to see that evolution over the last few years of people finally understanding the story is not, is a, it is a better way to market yourself and a, and a better way to market everything that you're doing. So. Well, thanks for that pitch. Um, I might reach out to you for a quote for my annual appeal, by the way. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, I'm glad to hear that. Um, it's, it's hard for us sometimes to know if what we've been working on is causing change on the, on the other end. So, okay, Ginger, you've been quiet for too long. <laughs> Give me and, a question. And I hope you're excited to answer this one. So yeah. what do you see as the current relationship right now between the creative world and the liberty movement? Okay, well, 
So I've been talking to a lot of people in the liberty movement about how we can use art to spread the message of freedom. And the really cool thing is people within the movement are really enthusiastic about this idea. They see kind of a, maybe a lack of a creative focus or they see it as a real opportunity to make change. And like I said before, the cool thing is we have a lot of artists in the world who are pro-freedom making cool art. Like, uh, for instance, B Banksy. Uh, do you know Banksy? One of the most popular artists in the world. He's a street artist. His, artist is very, his art is very freedom focused. Like he does art that critiques war or critiques um, you know, corrupt criminal justice systems. He's, and he's I, arguably one of the most famous artists in the world today. And so there is this, there, it exists, freedom art exists, but I think there is a disconnect in the organization, especially compared to like the progressive movement, for instance, you know, the progressive movement really utilizes art to push social change, to push social justice. And, and we don't do that. You know, the, the things the, the, that mass organization, getting people together, I, I don't think that exists right now in the liberty movement. I think there's a lot of opportunity, which is awesome. Um, so I think the, the current relationship is one of, you know, kind of curiosity, kind of, you know, what, how can we work together? I know, I know a lot of different institutes and foundations are really pushing for more creativity. Um, so I think good things are ahead in this relationship. Good things are ahead. Corey, you yeah. want to pipe in here at all? Yeah. I'm sure you're interested. Corey's an artist too, so. Oh, awesome. <laughs> I, I think that one of the biggest things that organizations struggle with, and the reason that I, I like this more uh, libertarian conservative-esque side struggles um, with art is because we are purists, right? Like we, everything has to be pure. And we have, it has to be 100% correct. And art is kind of messy. It's, it's kind of dirty. You try things, you push boundaries, you, you ex, it, it, successful art at least goes, all right, well, there is no wall, right? Like we can do whatever we want. Uh, and, and that kind of stands in the face of a lot of free market organizations and things like that. They want to have a very like regimented, this is, this is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to do it. And art kind of says, yeah, but let's think outside of that box. It's very odd to me that we are so pro entrepreneurship and yet we tend to not have a lot of entrepreneurship within that movement. Um, and there's kind of a risk averse uh, side of it. But that's why if you can focus in, and I know I keep saying this, so I'm sorry about beating a dead horse here, but if you can focus in on a really small target and go, I'm going to go after this, you, you minimize the risk that you have being artistic and trying new things. You can try something, you know, like if you're spending millions of dollars, probably don't want to put a lot of risk into it. But if you're going to spend a couple hundred dollars and put an ad out there, you, you might have the ability to try something that another organization isn't willing to try, you know, or put out a message that is a little bit different and makes people think a little bit differently. And it doesn't have to hit all the way across the board and you can still, you know, infuse a little try little things I guess is what I'm saying yeah and I think if you do things like that and you have clarity on what your brand promise is, and yeah. I try to push people for one brand promise a single one so that you can keep it in mind um, you can still link it to experiments I think a lot of times people are afraid to try something like an animated video for example because cartoons are not serious and part of our core brand is credibility well, yes, but no, you can make a car. It's very credible if you can take a complicated policy issue and make a sixth grader understand it, right? Yeah. That's and, very credible. And, yeah. and like I mentioned, Learn Liberty, their, their animation, they, they really do it in a professional, interesting way. Like no one could really argue that that's not credible. Right. Hey, maybe someone could. <laughs> okay, so Corey, how does the circle of creativity overlap with technology and how do organi organizations take advantage of that? Um, well, I think the big piece is that tech, like I, and I said this before, but technology, the, the cost of doing things from a technical standpoint has come down. Everybody does videos now, right? And the reason is because my daughter 
Um, she was showing me the other day like a, a video site where she literally can record a music video and upload it in a matter of seconds. And it's probably better than 90% of the videos I've ever done, right? And it, they put pictures <laughs> onto it. They put like, it, it's like perfectly timed. It's synced up and it's all done through technology. So technology is actually open the door for being able to quickly leverage ideas, which is an artist like dream, right? Because they can, there is no limit. I mean, there, there's, there's some, some limitations, but they literally can just go in and find something that they think is interesting. They can put it out. And again, low cost, low risk, because it didn't cost very much to do. Very few people will probably see it, but you can, but it could possibly catch on. And so um, that those two worlds are starting to finally come together where technology is, is, is not a limiter any longer for, for creativity or for experimentation. And it's actually opening the door of the reach that you can get with the, with the things that you're putting out as well. What's the name of that music video website? Do you know? Uh, I'll have to ask her what it is. It okay. is. And it's all teenage girls, by the way, on it. So yeah, <laughs> she shows it to me. I don't have it on my phone. But uh, <laughs> I'm not that guy. But um, yeah. So, <laughs> but it is interesting. So. Well, and I, it's interesting to look at things like that. That you're like, well, that's not really my cup of tea. But this is a trend that's going on, right? Like we were before we started, we were talking about how all of a sudden podcasts are really cool again. And yeah. like eight years ago, I was, you know, like people would. I, I, Corey, I don't remember if you were asked these sorts of questions during that time in your career, but they'd be like, how do I do a podcast? And you'd be like, well, this, there's this laborious recording process, and this is the equipment you need. And Michael yeah. Quinn Sullivan figured out how to fit it in just one bag, which was like a miracle. And then you have to edit it, and then you have to figure out how to host it without losing all your money. Now, you just like subscribe to a service. The built-in mic on my Mac is good enough, and I'm done right? The, the editing process is relatively simple. Um, so like the difference between then and now is interesting. And I wonder if that is feeding some of that resurgence. Well, I think even this discussion that we're having now is an example of technology has made life a lot easier. I mean, it used to be very difficult. I remember when I started at the Freedom Foundation, we, we did a weekly live show. Uh, I remember actually, that it was a monthly live show because and we had to have like servers that were we could only have a thousand people on at any given time and you know if we would watch the numbers go up and make sure if they hit a thousand we were like oh shoot we're gonna crash any second now and, the <laughs> and it was thousands and thousands of dollars worth of equipment just to do this one show and now it's like oh yeah there's a website you can just download this thing and all of a sudden you're streaming it out to tens yeah. of thousands of people I mean Facebook has Facebook live yeah um I, I will be interested to see, and, and that's where like that artistic side really starts to take hold is when things like the technology is built out there, Facebook Live, then now I would love to see groups start to go, okay, well, how can we use Facebook Live? What are we seeing other people doing? How can we leverage those audiences to use something like that? Now, I think it's dumb, but, <laughs> we do, and that's the other thing is you kind of have to put that on the back shelf of like, yeah. why, would, why would anybody want to watch me talk live? It doesn't matter if you understand the technology and why people use it, try to yeah. people are using it, experiment within that world, try different things, try to create compelling, you know, put your stuff out there in a compelling way. That's a good point. So Ginger, how can we use art to spread the, the a passion for freedom in your opinion? Okay. Which is sort of how you got a job for me was like by starting with the why. <laughs> yeah. So how can we do that? Um, well, I think, the first thing is we need to get more mainstream. The freedom movement, libertarians, we need to get more in the, the, the cultural conversation. And art's going to do that more so than facts, more so than policy info. And the really cool thing is that art's really fluid. It's one word that means about a billion things, right? It means uh, poetry, uh, music, visual art, video art. It's it's like the best word in the English in the English language art, just because it means anything. It's so open ended and fluid, and I think it, we can really tap into new markets that we haven't before by understanding them and speaking to them in their own specific art language, whatever that is. Um, 
we're trying one new art language at Spark Freedom. We're really excited to to kind of launch our new Arts and Minds Experience program. We're going to be doing events, hopefully one day around the country, but we're starting with our first one this summer in Portland, Oregon. We're going to have kind of a, a one-day art festival where there's going to be activities. The main event is going to be a, a mural painting. People are going to be invited to paint a mural, and the whole event is going to be on theme with a, a policy issue, we're doing criminal justice. So we're in our early stages of, of planning and figuring out what we're doing. But um, you know, like uh, like Corey said, we're really trying to to approach this big this big idea of art, and kind of focus it in to one specific thing and, and see how it goes. Um, we'll see. <laughs> so. Corey, I'm interested to get your thought on this concept and I'll break it down a little further for you. So the, the Arts and Minds is a mural print painting project that will bring people to get people from outside of Portland, people from inside of Portland together to work on painting a story on a mural of um, like how women are getting trapped in the criminal justice system in Oregon. Most of them for victimless crimes, for addiction um, related crimes, right? And the whole purpose of this is get people, like, regardless of where you are politically together, to just talk about the core issue and not, not make it partisan. There's not a policy panel, but I think it will be informed in advance by, by policy work. So, like, there's a bunch of work that's gone in in advance for policy work. We get people together to paint the mural, and then we link them if they're really motivated with things they can, like, individual citizens can do to help like whether it's mentor a woman who's coming out of the prison system as she's getting back into her life, like really tangible things like that, or get involved with one of the many policy organizations that are working on this issue. So we're sort of seeing it as like a way to not focus around the policy to get people interested in doing something to, to make a reform. What do you think about that idea? I think it's awesome. I think anytime you can tap an audience that is not your typical audience. Portland, Oregon is not the bastion of, you know, I mean, there's a lot of libertarians there, but they don't know it, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you know, and so I think that anytime you can go after an audience and, and, and capture an audience and, and try something a little different and help them understand your point of view, you're winning, right? And I think that's what's really cool about the idea behind this is that, is it, the typical thing that, that a free market organization would do? No, but I think that's what makes it unique and, and what makes it likely to be successful is because you're going to pull in a new audience, right? And now you have new people that you can talk with and you can get share ideas and they can, they can give you their point of view and it, it expands your understanding of, of policy. The problem is, is we, you know, uh, I think you were talking about this before is that like you can't speak inside of an echo chamber and we tend to do that a lot. And so the more that you can um, let people know that you're being, they're being heard, but also and be inclusive in your communication, mm -hmm. it helps you better your communication and become more effective at being able to speak with those people about very complex problems, right? Like the problem is, is that people on the right and people on the left or people in the middle, we all boil things down to like, if we only just did this, right, it would fix all of our problems. Well, mm -hmm. it's not always that easy. There's a lot of nuances to it that we need to figure these things out. And so anytime that you can um, have communication across those different lines, you are really, you are, you're more likely to come up with a more creative solution to the problem, which is, I think, that's what I would love to see is more creative policy solutions as well as creative ways of communicating, which I know we're talking about communication here, but right. there probably are more creative solutions to and more artistic solutions to the problems than the ones that we typically kind of pound the drum about. Right. That makes sense. Okay. And Ginger is muted. Yes. My apologies. I just, I just said creative. Right. <laughs> Creative solutions. That's my favorite phrase. And there just are not enough creative solutions in this world. We need more. Yes. We need more. Yeah. Well, and especially on December 15th, the deadline for signing up for your much more expensive health insurance 
or get fined day. <laughs> I have, so I did a podcast on, on like ideas for like health share options for the homesteader because your budget's usually pretty low and, and yet um, the premiums are in like for us, it would be a thousand dollars a month. Um, and I, you know, like the, the options that are out there are not, not necessarily the right options for everybody. But I was like, you can do this, you can do that, you can do nothing, you can get a subsidy and you know, this is how it is. I personally have a health share um, that I've had for a few years. So I just shared what it was like to be on that. All of a sudden this last week, I've been like answering a lot, like six tons of questions about health share from people who are kind of freaking out because they've just found out their premiums are doubling in, or, you know, like some, some people are not having that problem, but a lot of people are I'm talking to are having premiums that have doubled and they're like, okay, so we thought about this last year. Like what's that health share thing? It's funny how, when you, you do something creative and like just share a story. Like I was just sharing my own story. Um, all of a sudden I'm sought out by different people, like multiple different people. And I'm probably doing more to share the word, uh, spread the word now for health, health share options than, you know, than people who have researched about them for many years. Cause I'm helping the end person who needs the help. So anyway, okay, questions from the audience. Again, if you want to put a question in, um, click on the Q&A button and submit your question. I have one here that I wrote because I thought of it while I was hearing uh, video, not video, Corey, talk about video. And uh, this is one I get all the time and I want to ask you this, this question. And it is, um, I just released a video and it's only gotten about 200 views. What do I do about that? Move on. Move on. So um, this is where we get into some things don't hit. Like we have ideas that we think are just brilliant. And then you put them out there and nobody, it doesn't click with people. Um, first of all, if your video isn't hitting, either you are mar not marketing it correctly. So you could do promotion. You could try to push it out there via social media. Um, I think that more likely is, uh, and this is where we get into where technology has really, the cost of technology has decreased. And because of that, you actually can hyper-focus your video content to specific audiences. So I can make one video and try to sell it to everybody, or I can make five videos and try to sell each one to a very different audience and speak directly to them. And that really is the more impactful way. And that is, and it's not, the cost difference is minimal at most, at best, you know, like there's not much of a cost difference in terms of making five videos versus making one. So mm -hmm. if you're not getting hits on content, maybe you didn't focus on the right audience. Uh, maybe you need to um, re-edit the video to focus on a very specific audience and address concerns with that audience. It comes back to listening and hearing what your audience is saying and what problems they are having and making sure you address them in the video. And then um, remember the platform, not just the audience you're talking to, but the platform you're using also should define the way the content is displayed. So um, if, you, if you aren't getting hits, try something different, you know, like, um, you know, don't try to, there's not a silver bullet when it comes to video. There have been great videos that get no hits. And then there's some cat video that's terrible and, you know, but somehow hits with everybody, you know, like nobody understands that if, if, if somebody says they understand and they can make your video go viral, they are lying to you. They would be billionaires if they could. Nobody right. knows how to do it. It is, it is kind of hit or miss. But that's why you, you try to build audiences with your video content. You don't try to get out there and, and get everybody in. So you, you need to be very focused, I guess, would be the best way to put that. Great. I don't have other questions coming in today, which is a little odd. Um, but I do have a question I'm wondering, because a lot of people who are watching this or think they're probably sitting here going, are what, like, I'm, it's all I can do to get my policy work and be furthering these these efforts and and awareness campaigns in my um in my state and like art what so what are one or two or three things that you think like on the think tank side they could start doing related to bridging like using 
art or story or other things to bring people into their network like that are tangible for a person that is doable and doesn't, you know, cost a million dollars, require you to launch a new event in Portland, Oregon, painting a mural. Like those are big <laughs> ideas. I'm hoping to see lots of policy guys out there painting this mural, by the way. I really hope that we attract that. But uh, that's us. We're like, we're the weird creative people in the movement. Like what does the think tank do? Either uh, one of you can answer this. And actually both of you should. Yeah, well, I mean, what, what are the people at that think tank like to do? I mean, likely there's someone who can draw or who can write poetry or who can do something, you know, tap into the talent that you have. And I mean, I, I love poetry. I think, <laughs> I think it's um, in written form or if a YouTube video could get up and, and say something that might not do anything, who knows, that video might get five hits, or it could really tap into someone who had no idea that this even existed, but they're into poetry. Um, or, you know, including doing, doing some kind of illustration that you could submit to a local newspaper or a state newspaper, just, I mean, hitting, I think art really can tap into tap into the minds of people who haven't been tapped into before. You know, depending on on what you can bring to the table, that might be five new minds, that might be a thousand. So, I think tapping into the resources uh, at the think tank because you have talented, creative people at your think tank, and they might have talents that don't relate to their job at all, that you don't even know exist, that are there. Like you may have a master painter. You know, in the John Kramer in the coffee room. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, Corey, what do you what 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 do you got for us? I yeah, I would just kind of echo a little bit of that. Like, I think finding finding what people are passionate about outside of and outside of the think tank world it, or in, outside of the job, and then and then really taking advantage. I mean, that's exactly what Ginger was saying. But like, there are some great ideas. I remember when we were at the Freedom Foundation, when I was at the Freedom Foundation, we started doing podcasting a long time before. And there was this one idea where we had a um, lawyer who was like, I want to do a lawyer podcast because he loved talking. And I was like, this sounds terrible. Who's, <laughs> who's going to listen to a couple of lawyers talk about the latest Supreme, you know, state Supreme Court justices and why and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like this, like, I would want to like I would, you know, it'd be, I'd be done. I would just leave. Right. So they went in and, but they really loved kind of chatting back and forth and, and it was kind of part of their personality to kind of banter back and forth and they created a really good report. Now, granted, they didn't get a huge audience of people, but they got a really devoted audience of people. Mm -hmm. And so because they were passionate about it, it came through in the podcast, you know, like, being a lawyer doesn't sound like something you should, you would be, you know, super passionate about. But if you find people that are passionate about specific things, if they're passionate about, you know, movies or if they're passionate about art or poetry or, or even, you know, less creative things, then, and you take advantage of that and give people the opportunity to kind of use that and, and combine that with policy things that you want to discuss, you really can create people can hear your passion, right? So you want to make sure that you try to create that opportunity for, for those ideas and for those things to come, come out of people. Totally. And I mean, art essentially is passion. You know, our art kind of defines the human existence. We live art in our day-to-day -day life and just realizing that and tapping into it, tapping to tapping into the creativity and new idea and new thought that you offer to the world is really interesting. Great. Well, thank you both for making time today. We'll have it available for later viewing next week. And um, just as a reminder, our next park session is January 19th with Sue Zoldak. And we hope everybody has a fantastic Christmas, Hanukkah, or whatever you celebrate. Like, take this time with your family, regenerate, because we've got another year to fight for liberty, right? <laughs> <laughs> Talk to you later. Thank you, Nicole. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>